Okay, uh, you're good to go. Have a good meeting. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so hello, good afternoon or good morning. My name is Ben Schumacher. Uh, I will be uh, the co chair together with uh, Georgios Panagiotakos. Um, so we will have uh, six talks about cryptographic protocols and secure computation. And the first speaker is already up. Uh, it will be uh, Stas Jarecki with a talk about the security or insecurity of the Divi Hellman Oblivious PRF with multiplicative multi blinding. Uh, Stas, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Barry. Uh, welcome everyone. And very nice seeing you. Uh, so uh, this is a, a talk on a paper on about insecurity of this, uh, this method of oblivious PRF, and it's a, a paper with Hugo Krawczyk and uh, Jiao Xu. I'm Stanislaw Jarecki. Okay, sorry. Um, I I didn't switch on. I go to the laser pointer. Okay, now I have it. Okay. Uh, what's oblivious PRF? So a uh, classic definition by Friedman et al. is that uh, it's a secure computation uh, for the following functionality. So say you have some PRF F. Uh, the client inputs an argument, the server inputs a key, and the client computes just one value of the PRF at the argument the client provided, and the server learns uh, nothing, in particular does not learn the argument on which the PRF was blindly, obliviously computed. Okay, so PRF is a fundamental tool, right? This can be a blind decryption, blind encryption, blind max. It has tons of applications, uh, beautiful applications, uh, set intercession, has I Lindel, tons of other stuff. In particular, uh, you know, this is our uh, application from the previous paper uh, uh, about uh, uh, the particular method for uh, as asymmetric password authentication, where you build in the strong property of uh, randomized password hashes uh, as follows. The client computes this in a blind way on a password and basically it changes the low entropy string to a high entropy. One, and this is an old idea citing from Port Kaliski and Xavier Boyan. And then this high entropy string is a key. So it can be used for signing, encryption, uh, whatever public key uh, authentication method, right? So all of these applications uh, basically motivate how do you do this uh, obvious PRF in a fast and secure way. Here is one protocol. We call it hashed DV Hellman. Um, uh, let H be a hash onto a group, a uh, cyclic group where Diffie Hellman assumption holds. So, K is the exponent, right, of the order of the group. This already inside is a pseudo random function uh, under the definitional Diffie Hellman assumption. Computational one is a new outward hash. There is some technicalities that are related to this protocol. So, uh, here is how to blindly compute it. Uh, the client on X maps to the group and exponentially to a blinding factor. The server exponentiates to the key, the, the client deblinds, right, and computes the right value and then, okay. So this is a very inexpensive protocol, one, two exponentiation for the client, one exponentiation for the server. And in this paper with Agielos Kiaias, we showed that it realizes a very strong uh, notion of universally composable OPRF in particular, the strength implies that uh, this server has a choice of a key, which is like a choice of a random function. And every, uh, on every key, this function is different, has no correlations between different functions for different keys. So, okay, this is great, this is very fast, um, okay, or fast enough, uh, perhaps, but actually it can be done even faster. So here is a change, okay, so look, look here and look here, okay, that's the place that it changes. Uh, it's blinding, instead of taking h to the x to the random, you multiply by a random group element, and then you can deblind if you are given an extra uh, side information g to the k. 
right? Because g to the k to the minus r is the same as g to the r to the k. Okay, so this is a Chams blind RSA protocol. Uh, it has a long history, many uses. And what, what what's the point? Because we changed variable based exponentiation. In the previous one was a to the x was a variable base and b was a random uh, group element, right? To fixed base, right? This one for sure fixed, this one fixed in many, many applications because it's the one key and you authenticate to it all the time, for example. Uh, so this is a significant speed up, um, okay? And uh, the question obviously is, is this just a secure? It should be, right? Because it looks uh, kind of like these things are interchangeable. Not exactly. Here is a um, <clears throat> server without lots of generality. He can exponentiate this part. I mean, for whatever discrete logarithm is here, he can use it with a multiplicative shift, okay? So this multiplicative shift, whatever it was, it comes out in, 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 you know, from these equations. So effectively, what he computes, what the server computes is this function for the, for the client. What does it mean? Effectively, he chooses two values instead of one, not just k, but k comma delta. And for every k comma delta, the function is different. So are they substantially different being thought? This is also a PRF. So who cares that it's a different PRF? Right for all these applications should work. Not exactly. They have the, what this gives to the client is the ability to program collisions. Two keys, k delta and k delta prime, can map to the same value on one argument x star, and this is what we show in the paper. So first of all, we observe that easy to observe thing, and also we analyze it, showing there are no more uh, abilities to correlate anything. For all the other arguments x different from x star, x star chosen by the server, these functions are decorrelated. Okay, so now my last slide. Uh, uh, the sort of short thing about what's the rest. What do we do here with this? So first of all, we, we, we show some applications where this ability to program collisions actually builds in an attack. It builds an attack that is like an online test. He guesses, he chooses some X star, the server, the malicious server, on which two functions are correlated. And in applications where somebody repeatedly asks uh, the OPRF on the same value, like for example, password authentication, this is an online test for a password because you can see whether the values or outputs are the same or not. Uh, this can be stopped in many ways, put a NISIC, you add some exponentiations, actually certify this public key. Well, you rely on certification or on storage. A very easy fix here, okay? Add G to the K to the hash. And the only thing that we see that is not quite okay with this is that it stops being interoperable with the exponentiation method, which is has smaller bandwidth. So you cannot do like we, we IoT, uh, Internet of Things, people said like, we want the low bandwidth protocol to work as well with the same function, okay? And it just doesn't work in that. Uh, okay, so what do we do with this? We show that it does realize something we call correlated OPRF. So it's a relaxation of the OPRF model, strong model with the one I was talking about with Agelos at the beginning. These are random functions except for one point. And uh, what's the class of uh, protocols that this is okay with? Because it builds an online test, it's PAKES. If you're using it for a PAKE like in OPAKE, it is fine. Uh, you drive down the cost of PEG in this way, right? By using the multiplicative result. And you allow interoperability. And you can use it in other places, but I think that it's only there is a need if you want to be interoperable with other things, because in most applications, one of these fixes is going to be fine uh, for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Stas. Nice to hear. Uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, we already have run out of time. Almost uh, one quick question, maybe. So, um, so there's adversarial behavior by the uh, server uh, for the uh, additive blinding case. Is it also possible that the client can do some harm? No. Uh, but the client no. cannot cheat. No, he cannot cheat. He got exactly one value 
uh, it is under the assumption, sorry, I never said that, uh, the assumption is uh, pretty similar in the proof as in here, uh, which is gap one more dh. So it's, uh, it is a gap assumption, right? The server exponentiates to the key. So how can you argue that it, you cannot exponentiate many values? It's a gap. It's a one more type of, sorry, not one, no. It's a one more type of assumption, right? He yeah. exponentiates n things. You can only compute n points under the one more type of assumption. And we need a gap for UC uh, shenanigans. Um, and, and that's in both cases, yeah, but multiplicative and additive. Yeah. yeah, and in the same, in nothing changes except actually we need a stronger, uh, is, is, we call it gap plus. The, uh, the Oracle access, we couldn't get it from just GAP uh, because we, we needed more than just a DDH Oracle to, sim to simulate. Uh, the GAP, it's an extended DDH Oracle. It's uh, secure, for example, anyway. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we have to move on to the next talk. Uh, so there's a, there's a question, there's a question no, in no, Soli. Yes. There's a question in Soli both of our stash you got done. What should I do? Uh, there's another question in uh, Zulip. You guys. Oh. Okay, great. But you yes, can you yes. can move it. You can Sorry use... for running out of time, but I will go to the Zulip and and yeah. uh, please anybody ask me questions on this Zulip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy. <laughs> enjoy, just please. Have uh, an efficient and any construction for signals hand sake, post quantum state legal secure and deniable, and uh, Kitaro is gonna give us a talk. Sorry, I muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, thank you for introduction. Uh, my, my name is Keitaro. Today, uh, we will tell you about an efficient and then construction for signals handshake, post quantum, state leakage secure, and deniable. Uh, this is joint work with Shuich Katsumata, Chris Kuyaftukuski, and Thomas Press. In this work, we realize the first practical and post quantum signal protocol. The two realize this. In this work, we formalize signals initial key agreement protocol for XDDH protocol and propose generic construction as alternative to XDDH protocol. In addition, we provide the implementation result of our proposed protocol. So let's start talk about background. Now, recently, a lot of people use instant messaging application to communicate each other. In instant messaging, Users send and receive messages asynchronously through the server. For example, when Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she sends a message to the server and the server stores it temporarily. Then when Bob becomes online, he accesses the server and receives messages to him. In this way, we can send and receive messages even when the communication partner is offline. However, there is a risk that malicious server may reveal messages. In fact, it was revealed that a service provider helped an intelligent agencies with collected messaging, like this figure. Therefore, to ensure security and privacy of messages, a secure instant messaging is widely used. In, instant, uh, in secure instant messaging, Messages are encrypted with pre-shared secret key. Hence, the server cannot access the encrypted contents. In this work, we focus on Signal. Signal is a widespread secure instant messaging application. Uh, to encrypt messages, uh, Signal uses a Signal protocol based on Diffie-Hellman assumption. And uh, signal protocol is deployed in a lot of messaging applications, such as Signal, WhatsApp, and Facebook Messenger. Hence, uh, billions of users use a signal protocol in the world. Uh, let's see how signal protocol works. 
signal protocol consists of two phases. First, Alice and Bob establish a shared secret key via XDDS protocol. Then, uh, they start the actual encrypted communication via double ratchet protocol. When Alice sends the messages, she choose a new secret key shown in red and encrypt the messages and the key in the pre-shared secret. Then she uh, sends them to the server. When both becomes online, he receives the message from the server and decrypts uh, them with gray key. Then Bob uh, obtains the messages and the new uh, shared secret. This is a signal protocol. This the double protocol and the XAH protocol were proposed in 2016. Afterwards, Congordon et al. analyzed the security of signal protocol. In, uh, in 2019, Arwen et al. formalized the security models of double ratchet protocol and they propose a generic construction of double ratchet protocol, which can be instantiated from post quantum assumption. Thus, we already have a post quantum double ratchet protocol. On the other hand, as for XDH protocol, the security models has not been formalized. In addition, uh, there are no known construction from other than Diffie-Hellman assumption, as well as genetic construction. Thus, uh, post-quantum XCDH protocol is lag. Therefore, in this work, uh, our pro uh, purpose of this work is uh, formalizing the security models of XCDH protocol and designing a genetic construction of the XCDH protocol that can be instantiated from post-quantum assumption. Then, uh, this is the, our uh, contribution. Uh, our contribution is a design and implementation of generic construction as an alternative to the XCDH protocol. Uh, our contribution is three-fold. First, we formalize the XCDH protocol as a specific type of uh, authenticated key exchange protocol. We call it signal conforming AK protocol. And we uh, provide the uh, formal security model and the required functionality. Uh, second, uh, we propose generic construction of post quantum uh, signal conforming AK protocol uh, based on key encapsulation and signature scheme. Uh, finally, uh, we implement. Uh, our uh, CAK protocol with NIST PQC candidates. Then uh, we evaluate the computation and the communication cost. In this work, we focus on the initial key exchange protocol of signal protocol and propose the post quantum one, uh, combining it with the post quantum double digit protocol proposed by Arwen et al. Uh, we obtain the first post quantum signal protocol. Thank you, for your, thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Hidaro. Uh, so any questions from the audience? Um, maybe can I ask, uh, I'm, I'm curious, I, mean, I, I really like the, the, the goals of the work but I'm, I'm a bit curious what makes an authenticated key exchange protocol signal um, compliant or so what are the what are some of the properties that you need? Uh, so you ask the required property of the signal protocol for authenticated key exchange? Yes, of the authenticated key exchange. Ah, okay. Use, yeah. First, so to achieve asynchronous communication, the first message is independent from communication partner. So we uh, call this property receiver obliviousness. And existing protocol doesn't, some existing protocol does not achieve this property. And uh, we define the uh, required security property called state leakage security. This is a stronger security notion for uh, authenticated key exchange. And there are no known uh, post-quantum authenticated exchange that uh, satisfies both 
property. So we create a new genetic construction that achieves to uh, both uh, required property. Any other questions? Um, I guess we're we're on time to move to the to the next talk, and you can take other questions from Julip. Barry, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, for the other questions, please uh, turn to Julip. Um, so we will have our third speaker. It's uh, Alex Davison, uh, presenting. Uh, uh, joint work with uh, three co-authors on uh, round optimal verifiable oblivious pseudo random functions from ideal lattices. Uh, Alex, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Alex. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about some joint work with Martin Albert, Tamit Dio, and Nigel Smart on round optimal verifiable oblivious pseudo random function protocols or VOPRFs from uh, ideal lattices. So um, our construction is the first uh, VOPRF protocol uh, to be built from lattice-based hardness assumptions, and it's kind of related to these um, classic uh, classical VOPRF um, uh, protocols that uh, Stanislav uh, Yavriki um, presented in the talk in, earlier in the session. Um, our protocol holds in the quantum random, uh, quantum random oracle model, um, which like, strengthens the uh, quantum uh, credentials with the security argument. But um, one of the caveats I kind of want to offer um, firstly is that this is entirely a feasibility result. Um, so we saw many applications for these protocols um, that, requ that require like very efficient constructions, but our construction is going to be focused purely as like a, a theoretical result and we'll see why soon. So um, these protocols uh, kind of rely on two parties. So we have a client and a server, the client has an input X and the server has an input K. And the client wants to learn the output of a pseudo random function on those two inputs. The security properties that we guarantee are that the server learns nothing about the client's input X and that the client learns nothing about the server's input key K. And then for verifiability, we, we have this like extra property, which is that the server proves that the output was also evaluated using its key K. So the reason that I'm talking about VOPRF specifically is because um, they're used in some applications. So uh, in particular, they are like quite quite critical building blocks in many internet protocols, particularly some that are being standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force. So we have the Privacy Class Protocol, which is used quite widely um, by like Cloudflare and Google Chrome, and that's a private authorization protocol, and that uses VOPRFs. Um, and then we saw before that Opaque was mentioned, and this is a password authentication key exchange, which uses OPRFs. Um, without the verifiability is like a building block. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm kind of just going to talk about our construction um, as it is. So uh, to set the scene, we're going to be focusing on like a classic ring OWE setting. Uh, one thing I want to note is that we have this like modulus P, um, which is going to be used for rounding and this divides like the rings modulus Q. Um, and then the other things I kind of want to draw attention to are kind of the error distribution setup that we have. So we have this um, error distribution in violet, which is the same as the key space. And this is going to be a Gaussian distribution parameterized by the standard deviation parameter of sigma. And then we're going to use this like wider error distribution uh, in green, which has this parameter sigma prime. And the, um, the guarantee that we have is that um, hopefully that sample, well, not guarantee, but uh, we hope that samples from this other distribution will drown samples from the uh, the other distributions. And then the other things are that we internally are going to use this uh, pseudo random function from Banerjee and Piker, which is based on uh, Ring LWE from Crypto 2014. And we're also going to use a series of Zinonage proofs, which we can instantiate um, using uh, recent lattice based methods, some of which are quantum random oracle model compatible. Um, and so I'm going to. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk through our protocol. Um, I'm going to assume throughout that the zero knowledge proofs kind of assert the, the construction of each message and that they are verified during the protocol. So in the offline phase of our protocol, firstly, the server is going to commit to its key K. Essentially, all it does is construct like the right-hand side of a ring LWE sample where its key is a secret. And then the public element A is kind of this known uh, value that the client also knows. Um, and this is to prove verifiability in the online phase. So in the online phase, the client, essentially what it does is it encodes its input X to the ring using this um, internal PRF that I mentioned and adds on this blinding factor, um, which is again, at the right hand side of the ring LWE sample with secret set to S that the client has like sampled and then stores. 
Um, the server gets this message and then responds with DX, which is kind of just CX multiplied by its QK, and then added on with this like drowning error uh, that I mentioned. So the output of the PRF eventually is going to be the rounded uh, form of AX multiplied by K. Um, and I'm just going to talk about how like correctness and security holds. So um, in, to, in order for correctness to hold, we have we have this um, equation. We kind of need this error term highlighted in green to like go to zero. Um, so what we can do, because um, K, S, and all the errors are kind of sampled from these short distributions, we can bound the total error term within this uh, small interval of minus T to T. Um, and what we show is that our correctness argument is kind of like computational in the sense that um, correctness doesn't hold if a coefficient of the polynomial AX multiplied by K is within minus T and T of a rounding boundary. Um, but we show that any such coefficient would also lead to a break of the one dimensional short integer, uh, short integer solution problem or 1DSIS. Um, and then later on as well, we, um, we prove uh, security against malicious adversaries. Um, I'm not going to talk about it here, but you can refer to the paper in the longer version of the talk uh, for that argument. But And this argument relies on the hardness of ring LWE and again, 1DSIS. So in terms of why our protocol isn't um, yet efficient enough to be used in like common applications in the real world. So um, essentially we have this um, super polynomial um, dependence of Q and the um, sigma prime on the security parameter. And so Q is super polynomial because of the underlying pseudo random function that we use, uh, the Banerjee Pike uh, POF. And sigma prime is uh, super polynomial because of this um, noise drowning approach that we use. So with these asymptotic costs in mind, we can kind of like estimate like the concrete costs and we get um, our, our solution if we compare it to kind of like the state of the art in VOPRS in terms of the classical cases, orders of magnitude um, less efficient and that's even before we uh, take into account like the zero knowledge proofs that we, we have to use and um, it's kind of a similar case as well for other post quantum, another post quantum candidate um, based on isogenies uh, by Bowden et al. So just to finish up, um, so yeah, we built the first post-quantum VOPRF from lattice-based hardness assumptions, um, but all post-quantum proposals currently suffer from very expensive costs due to these zero-knowledge proofs and the large parameter settings. And so in terms of future work, we think um, it'd be really valuable to try and reduce or remove some of the zero-knowledge proofs that we consider while still ensuring verifiability. And then also to try and um, mitigate for either the noise drowning, um, well, either mitigate for or remove the noise drowning approach that we use and sort of maybe try and uh, use a more efficient internal uh, pseudo random function um, in, uh, in order to encode the inputs to the ring. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you too, Alex. Um, any questions, quick questions? One or two minutes. So, so I have a question. Um, did you consider uh, like generic constructions in the sense of breaking the primitive into into building from similar primitives the verifiable oblivious random function? Um, do you mean generic in the sense that using like standard two-party computation protocols, or do you mean generic in a different sense? No, starting from simpler primitives where you instantiate them uh, using lattices and then uh, building up to oblivious uh, random functions. Just wondering. Um, we didn't. We didn't really um, consider generic uh, approaches merely because um, it was difficult. Like typically, the most efficient constructions in the classical setting are like custom built approaches, and we we went down the custom built approach to try and emulate kind of what was going on in the classical world in the post quantum lattice space setting. But I'm I, I'm pretty convinced that there would be generic approaches to this, and it would be it'd be interesting to know to like compare which of those methods would be best in terms of like practicality and efficiency. Okay. Then, yeah, I think, uh, well, Georges, you, you can uh, continue with the next talk uh, introducing. Okay. okay. Yeah, so the next, the next talk is Beyond Security and Efficiency on Demand Ratcheting with Security Awareness. And uh, Betul is gonna uh, present. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bechul Durag from uh, Bosch Research. The uh, context of this talk is secure messaging with the ratcheting. Uh, it's a joint work with Andrea Coforio and the Sarge Wodenin from EPFL. Um, so 
in secure uh, end to end messaging, we worked with two party settings where the communication between participants uh, is bi directional and asynchronous. And in terms of security, we looked into two different notions. The first one is a forward security. And it says that whenever an uh, internal state of a participant is exposed, forward security preserves the confidentiality of all the messages uh, that have been sent or received in the past. And the uh, construction, constructions providing forward security can be achieved by using a very cheap uh, cryptographic primitives such as one-way functions. And this uh, ratcheting, uh, this is this concept is known as ratcheting in the literature. The second uh, security notion we looked into is post compromise security or PCS, uh, known as PCS. And uh, the idea in PCS is to protect the security of the future communication after an exposure happens. And indeed, with uh, PCS, uh, after a round trip exchange between participants, Alice and Bob, the security is uh, re restored or, or healed. And uh, the, uh, unlike the forward uh, secure constructions, PCS requires public key crypto systems. Therefore, they are more expensive to, to, to achieve. Uh, in the literature, we have seen uh, various uh, pro proposals of uh, communic secure communication providing these two types of security. And in our work, we compare them in terms of efficiency. And at the end of this talk, I will briefly mention them uh, as well. So when we look at the real world cryptography, the, uh, the popular application that we have is a signal. And signal uses a double ratcheting mechanism. And in there, what happens is that whenever the direction of the communication between participants uh, is the same, then the protocol only uses the forward secure primitives, which are cheap. And uh, every time the direction of the communication changes, then it uses both. So the, uh, the, both uh, the forward secure and post compromise secure primitives are in play. So uh, what is uh, not, uh, this is not flexible at all. So it, only, it really depends on the direction of the communication and uh, it doesn't, uh, for instance, if Alice is uh, keep sending messages to Bob in the, staying in the same direction, but uh, leaving her phone unattended uh, or leaving lots of time between messages, still the weak security is preserved. And on the uh, and the, similarly, if there is active communication happening between Alice and Bob, uh, even though direction is changing often, that means that it is using post compromise security primitives, which is expensive. Maybe it is not required to change uh, the direction all the time with the message exchange because there is because there is an active messaging going on. So what I'm trying to say is that we propose a new method, uh, which uh, which is which turns on and off the post-compromise secure primitives on demand instead of by fixing it with the direction of the message changes. So we, the idea is to have two layers of protocols. The, the first layer is a main, uh, we call it upper layer. It's called main in this picture. Um, and it pro provides both types of security. And uh, this uh, can be turned off. The PCS can be turned off uh, to provide only forward security, hence making the communication faster in, when necessary. And uh, the post-compromise security can be turned back on by by uh, calling the main upper layer uh, protocol again. And this can continue arbitrarily throughout uh, the communication between parties. Okay, so the second contribution we had is uh, called security awareness and it comes with uh, few properties. Um, the first one is recover security. This has been studied in the Rock Wadden paper uh, before. The, the half of it was studied before. Uh, so the, the idea here is that uh, whenever a forgery happens, and this forgery can happen with, as an active attack when the external internal state of the participant is exposed, it, it can be used for impersonation. Um, so suppose Bob received a forgery, and uh, what we want is to uh, what we want is from the application is that Bob will not be able to receive any genuine messages from his uh, counterpart anymore. And uh, not only that, but also Bob, uh, we don't want Bob to be able to send any genuine messages to his counterpart either. So the, uh, the, the what this means is that the communication between participants will be cut off as soon as there is, a, there is an active attack. And this is kind of making, uh, uh, making aware the participants that there is an attack going on in the communication. 
Um, so the another uh, property we have is acknowledgement extractor. It's, it's kind of more intuitive uh, property. Whenever, uh, so when Bob sends uh, multiple messages, uh, when he receives the response for his uh, sum of messages, he will be able to also see an acknowledgement on the scene or, and received messages uh, and in which order they are uh, seen and received. Um, so uh, this provides the security awareness in the paper. The last contribution that we had is the uh, implementation of various different types of protocols from the literature that uh, have uh, studied the secure communication. And in this slide, I only show the runtime, but we have more in the in the paper with the state size and maybe more uh, maybe maybe also more different settings other than just alternating and deferred unidirectional uh, settings. So. Um, we did not implement on-demand ratcheting, but uh, so intuitively, we, we, what we propose is a generic construction, and uh, the uh, main layer, which is the upper layer, which provides both types of security, can be can be used to with uh, like it could be uh, any protocol which provides both types of security. For instance, the uh, PR protocol, Pottering Rösler protocol, or uh, uh, Jager Stefanov or, or JMM, all this uh, provides, or Durak Vaudene, they all provide both types of security. They can be used as the upper layer. And uh, for the uh, lower layer, which is the uh, only forward secure primitive, we implemented uh, Jan Vaudene. Uh, Yan Wadene protocol, which is extremely efficient. And the on demand ratcheting would be, for instance, if we use the drug Wadene paper uh, protocol, it will be in between this blue uh, circled curve and the red triangle curve. The, the complexity will be stay between these two, two curves. Um, so that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much. I can take the questions. Yeah, any questions? Thank you. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you think it is possible to get these properties somehow adapt your protocol to work on signal, uh, let's say as a as a on a higher layer with changing signal? Okay, so uh, I will just repeat the question because there was a uh, the voice broken up. Uh, so you said that is there any way to integrate these properties to signal? Is yeah. that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, I I think so. I believe so. The question is, I think if they want or not. So um, so this will imply, for instance, recover security will imply a communication cut. So this i don't know if uh, if signal wants to do that but uh, um, communication cut usually people don't prefer to do it it's kind of uh, not desirable but what uh, i can say is that in our paper instead of having two different types of uh, you know stronger secure and weaker secure primitives to switch between uh, it can be the lower layer uh, can be also same as main layer and uh, the communication goes in direct in this direction, and as soon as a uh, recover uh, security uh, security is uh, is in play, then recovery could go back to the upper layer to recover to continue communication. So the communication in this uh, part is going to be cut, uh, and it will be activating the upper layer to continue communicating. So I think this is uh, this is feasible. I don't know what would prevent that. Does it answer the question? Great. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, has this proposal been discussed with people in the MLS standardization, for instance? Uh, uh, yes, we gave a presentation uh, in a small workshop when after Eurocrypt 2019. I think uh, they are aware of this proposal. Yes. I, I believe also the uh, MLS proposed something similar to recover security because what we do with recover security is essentially kind of having a chain of uh, hashes of the history of the communication to provide this security. It's not too expensive. It's, it's actually quite cheap to, to, to add it. Uh, I believe it is that there is a proposal in MLS about recover security as well. But I may be wrong, actually, though this was quite involved or uh, Paul Rösler, they were quite involved. They may answer better than me. I was not so much in involved in the MLS. Does, does, does that answer the question? 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can go to the next talk. Thanks again, Matul. Thank you very much. Yes, um, we will have our next speaker, Lakshita Kuran, um, and her talk will be uh, on the CCA compatibility of the public key of public key infrastructures. So I hope she's ready. Yeah, I see her. Yeah. So uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, that works good. Great. Okay, um, so hello everyone. Uh, this is going to this talk is going to be on the CCA compatibility of public key infrastructure. Uh, this is joint work with Brent Waters at UT Austin. Um, so the notion of public key encryption that we you know all know and love allows Bob to set up and publish a public key in such a way that Alice uh, can send encrypted communication to Bob that can only be decrypted given knowledge of the corresponding secret key. And any adversary that observes this communication but cannot compute the secret key will be unable to distinguish encryptions of one message from encryptions of another. Um, this notion is called CPA security or security against chosen plain text attacks. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure that everyone can see the right side portion of my screen. I see some, uh, so is my slide completely visible? Uh, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, but what if the receiver actually only ever published a verification key for a digital signature scheme for which they possessed a signing key? Or more generally, what if the receiver publishes a puzzle for which only they know a solution and the solution is in general hard to compute? Um, <clears throat> can we still use this together with maybe other assumptions, but can we use this puzzle as a setup to do public key encryption instead? Uh, this question was one of the original motivations uh, for the problem of witness encryption. So Garg et al. showed that one can indeed uh, encrypt a message so that it can only be uh, opened by a recipient that knows an NP witness. And they used this primitive called witness encryption um, to, to build this um, uh, sort of compiler. Uh, moreover, assuming the existence of an appropriate witness encryption scheme, uh, no adversary can um, will be able to distinguish encryps encryptions of one message from encryptions of another unless they are able to also find uh, a solution to this hard puzzle. So, uh, so to motivate our problem statement, uh, let's take a deeper look at the security of public key encryption schemes. Schemes that satisfy the notion of CPA security often suffer from what are known as malleability attacks where an attacker can obtain a plain text, a ciphertext that encrypts a plain text, and the attacker doesn't know what plain text this is, uh, but is able to modify this ciphertext to come up with a different ciphertext that encrypts a related message. To defend against such attacks, uh, public key encryption schemes are now typically required to satisfy a stronger notion of CCA security. So here, an adversary cannot distinguish encryptions of two plain texts from each other, even given access to a decryption oracle that decrypts all possible related ciphertexts that the adversary can submit to this oracle. Um, so now uh, going back, our motivating question for this work is uh, going back to the setting of where Bob publishes a puzzle and Alice is able to encrypt a message so that only someone that can solve this puzzle is able to decrypt it. Uh, we know a solution based on witness encryption that gives us CPA security in this setting. Uh, and the question is, what about CCA security? Or more generally, um, and, and this brings me to also a statement of our results, what we show is that any key generation algorithm that gives rise to a sub-exponentially uh, CPA secure encryption scheme can be used as is. So the, so the exact same key generation and the exact same public key can be used to obtain also an NCCA secure encryption scheme, of course, under additional cryptographic assumptions. Uh, so in more detail, if we make appropriate cryptographic assumptions, and I'll get to the exact assumptions in a minute, any key gen algorithm that gives rise to a sub-exponential CPA secure encryption scheme against non-uniform adversaries 
Visho also gives rise to a CCA secure encryption scheme against uniform adversaries. And the assumptions that we make are the existence of hinting PRGs. So this was a primitive that was defined and constructed in a, a work of Coppola and Waters um, in a different context, they wanted to obtain CCA encryption from CPA encryption, but were okay modifying the setup. Um, and so they, they, they constructed this based on uh, the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption and the learning with errors assumption. In addition to this, we assume the existence of keyless collision resistant hash functions against uniform adversaries and with sub-exponential security. Um, and so this is just a hash function that is not keyed and where it is assumed that a uniform adversary cannot find collisions. Um, candidates for this can be SHA or AES uh, scaled appropriately. Um, so, uh, and so, so the first result is about going from CPA to CCA1 security. We also show that you can go from CPA to CCA2 security while preserving the exact same key generation algorithm uh, if, you, if we additionally rely on sub-exponential non-interactive CCA commitments for small tag spaces. And so this is a lot of words, uh, but in, in some more detail, uh, these, these types of CCA commitments that we need to use can be based, for example, on uh, the existence of time lock puzzles or on the quantum um, hardness as well as uh, quantum hard one-way functions and classically hard but quantum easy one-way functions. Um, so now let me say a little bit about uh, prior work and what we do that is different. Um, so pr prior to this work, um, there have been uh, many different uh, constructions of CCA secure encryption schemes and a few templates actually do manage to preserve key generation. For, uh, for example, the Fujisaki Okamoto transform um, uh, maintains the exact same public key, but it relies on a random oracle. And in this work, one of our focuses uh, is on preserving the exact same setup and, uh, and, and uh, giving a solution in the plane model. Uh, the now young encryption system uh, does modify the public key actually and requires two keys uh, and relies on the CRS model. Um, it can be modified to remove one of those keys. However, we also want to eliminate the CRS. So our focus in this work is no CRS, no random oracles are set up and to make black box use of the underlying CPA secure encryption scheme. Um, in the remaining one or two minutes I have, let me just give a bird's eye view of our construction. So like I said, an important um, uh, property that we want to preserve is that the key generation algorithm should simply output the public key of a CPA secure encryption scheme. And nevertheless, just by modifying the encryption and decryption algorithms, we should be able to get CCA security instead. Uh, so the encryption algorithm outputs, uh, sorry, samples a random PRG seed uh, and outputs the result of this PRG, let's call it Z0, XOR with the message M uh, that, that uh, we want to encrypt. I'm sorry, this should have been a small M instead of a capital M. And for every index I that is in, this, in N, where N is the size of the PRG seed, we, we uh, construct special commitments to every bit of the seed and encrypt the opening of these commitments via the CPA secure encryption scheme and via a different statistically binding commitment. The reason to do this is that uh, uh, somewhat similar to the now young template and uh, which, which has been used in many other constructions of CCA security and also a, a template developed more recently in Coppola Waters and in um, um, uh, and, and subsequent works. We want that there should be two ways to open any uh, given ciphertext. One is by decrypting using the encryption secret key and the other in our case, because we do not want to add a pub different public key, the other is going to be to just brute force break this statistically binding commitment. Uh, because we need to brute force break the statistically binding commitment in our proof, uh, this is where the reliance on sub-exponential uh, CPA security of the encryption scheme comes from. The invariant that we want to maintain is that decrypting the first ciphertext or brute force breaking the second commitment should both lead to recovering the same seed SI, which would mean that we would recover the same Z0 by computing the PRG on this seed, which would mean in turn that we would recover the same message M. Um, 
And the decryption algorithm is simple. It's just going to decrypt uh, the opening YI, use it to obtain a candidate seed SI. Uh, do you perform a few checks? If all those checks pass, use that to recover the message M, like I just said. So that's going to be roughly our construction. Um, and note again here that we did not need to modify the public key beyond um, the public key for the underlying CPA scheme. <clears throat> Um, in CCA2, we oh. just have a mic. Sita, please uh, try to wrap up a bit. Or... Yes, this is just my um, second to last slide. So I'll wrap up in less than a minute. Um, so- Well, you're already over time for that. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so so let me just wrap up then. Uh, CCA2, we, we have a minor difference. The commitment is a little bit different. And in summary, uh, we show, um, I've already said, stated the theorem statement, so let me not say that again. Let me just point out uh, to conclude one interesting open uh, direction that our work points to, which is, can you take the setup or key generation algorithm for one scheme and use it to implement a completely different scheme? So uh, can we take the key generation algorithm for a public key encryption scheme and use it to implement as is a digital signature scheme instead without having to do any additional setup? Um, this would be an interesting question to consider, not just for signatures and public key encryption. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Thank you for the, for the talk. Thanks. No, no immediate questions. So, Moti has a question. Maybe Moti, do you want to? Moti has a question on the chat. So do you want, okay. do you want yeah. to, to give it yourself? Or to repeat that question or what? I can, I can say that uh, Naur Jung is not, is not in the CRS model. The CRS is an abstraction and is part of the public key. Right, uh, absolutely, yes, uh, th th this is true. Um, and in, in our case, we don't want to add anything to the public key. So including the CRS for an ISIC, we just want to have the exact same public key as any general CPA secure encryption scheme. So uh, the motivation is a little bit different. I'm sorry if I was not very clear in the way I stated. Yeah, you said, you said Naur Jung is this in the CRS model. No, it is in the public key model. I yes, mean, the exactly. desire to do it in a different way is fine, but uh, you know, you have to be truthful about our model. Absolutely. And now you, and now you, and now you correct it, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Moti. I think it has been settled then. It's clear to everyone that it was in the uh, public key model. Uh, all right. So I think in the interest of time, we quickly have to move on to the final talk of the session that George just will announce. Yeah. So next, we have uh, cryptographic pseudorandom generator and generators can make crypto system problematic. And Cause is going to give the talk. OK. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. So, so uh, I'm Koji Nuida from the Kyushu University and AISD. So uh, actually, this is uh, midnight in my uh, time zone, and this is my first time to give a, a talk even after the day changes. OK, anyway, I start the presentation. And this is the summary of my talks. This actually, the, my result is that this picture is not true. So I mean that. So. When we have some uh, cryptographic scheme with some good property like the computational security or correctness, and so uh, this this such a uh, such a property is expected to be preserved if we use uh, cryptographically secure PRG. But actually, this is not always true. That's my uh, main result. And actually, the there is only a few. Uh, research in the literature uh, that concerns this uh, uh, behavior. And uh, I uh, extend them to the case of the, um, the multi party computation and the correctness of the public key encryption. OK, for the case of MPC, uh, we, uh, here we con uh, only concern the two-party computation case. And this is a rough picture of the two-party computation in the semi model. Here, we, the, we assume that the Party P1 is, uh, corrupt, is corrupted. And the important point is that P1 all, uh, uses a random number inside the 
inside him or her. And so by comparing this with the ideal case where the trusted third party helps, there are some additional objects uh, like this, and these should be simulated in the security proof. And the important point is that the here, it includes the random, random number inside the corrupted party. When we use, a, uh, when the, this uh, pro, uh, such a protocol is implemented by using a PRG inside the corrupted party, then the, this random, random seed for the PRG should also be uh, simulated by the security proof. And the important point is that the using the PRG is a kind of modification of the protocol. And the semi-honest model is a model where it is assumed that the, the parties uh, exactly follow the original protocol. So the semi-honest model may not uh, guarantee the security when the PRG is used because uh, using PRG is a kind of modification of the protocol. And actually, I gave uh, some example that the security is uh, actually lost when the se even uh, secure PLG is used. So I skipped the detail of the such an counter example because it's somehow uh, complicated. But the point is that in the case of MPC, the the random sheet in the PRG is visible for the adversary. For in this case, uh, the P1's internal random sheet is visible for the corrupted party P1. And this is very different from the security notion of the PRG, where the random sheet is not visible to the, uh, the distinguisher for the PRG. So this difference is uh, essential reason of the, such a kind of pro problematic behavior, I think. And this is this may be uh, somehow the problem in the in practice. So we consider the case that the, there is some the, some uh, protocol and the, some engineer implemented this by using the cryptographically secure PLG. It's a good way. I, we we think that it's a good way, but it may happen that the implemented scheme becomes insecure. And the protocol designer said that uh, the security proof assumes the ideal randomness. So the implementation should use the, the ideal randomness. Otherwise, the, the security proof doesn't guarantee the security in practice. But it's, it's very um, not reasonable because uh, implementing the ideal randomness is not, in not, fi not feasible in practice. So th that's the problem. And in order to guarantee the security after the use of PRG, I gave some sufficient condition uh, to guarantee the security. But I, I, or I again skip the detail, but actually this is not a very uh, strong result. But the, uh, so th this is very first uh, result for such a kind of sufficient condition. So we should uh, improve in, in the future work, I think. Okay, I move to the case of the correctness of the PKE. Before considering the correctness, I firstly consider the security, where everything is fine. So this is a picture of the Indo-CPA security of the PKE. And the, here, the plain text are chosen by the PPT, the PPT algorithms. And the security is related to the probability of this event. And in this case, when the, we consider the, the changing the randomness in the key generation by using the PRG, the, from the viewpoint of PRG, the, everything in the world is a PPT algorithm. So, so this, the probability of this event doesn't change, it changes only negligibly. And the same holds for the, the case of the randomness in encryption. So, it, this is the case, this is the situation for the security. On the other hand, in the case of correctness, the main difference here is that in this case, the correctness should be satisfied for any plain text. So this choice of plain text is very arbitrary. 
So it may not be, it, it's not always uh, the efficiently sampleable print list. That's the, the main um, problem here. In this case, when we consider the random uh, the PLG used, uh, used inside the encryption algorithm, so in this case, uh, this picture, this, the whole picture is not a uniform PPT algorithm. So if we assume the, the there is a gap between the, unif the security for, of the PRG against the uniform address, the distinguisher, and against the non-uniform distinguisher, if we have such, if you have the some gap between these two, then we have a counterexample that the when we uh, use the PRG in for encryption, then the correctness is lost. Uh, so I I I I forget to say that. Here, correctness means that correctness with uh, only negligible error probability. So that's an important point. And so, so, so Kodzi, maybe you can wrap up so we can have a, oh, okay, one, okay, one, one or two oh, questions. OK, I see. Thanks. So, so, okay. so the, in the key generation, for uh, the same, all, almost the same thing holds for the key generation algorithm. So now the, I, I, again, I gave some counter example in this situation. Okay, this, this is very minor uh, thing, so I skipped uh, the, the things, and this is a summary of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kondi. Uh So, any questions? Okay, so I have a question. So, what did you mean before in this theorem that uh, randomness should be used uh, as it is? You had this theorem earlier on. Oh. You said random, randomness should be used as is. So what did you mean by oh, that? You, uh, you mean this slide? Uh, you, you mean this slide? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So uh, in in some in, in some security proof for the MPC protocol, uh, so so the uh, the um, adversary's view should be uh, simulated, and the view includes the randomness, and sometimes the Simulator is constructed in a way that it firstly simulates the the messages um, received uh, sent from the other people, and then the simulator uh, the adjusts the randomness part um, by using the messages. This so it so my um, th this means that. Uh, such a kind of adjustment of the randomness doesn't happen. So the simulator, this simulator firstly chooses the simulated randomness and then the, the simulator outputs the other part of the, the simulated view. So th this is the, the meaning of this condition. I see, uh, thanks. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, okay, so then uh, I guess this is the end of the session. Thank so, you for, so is, for is last, watching. Please ask questions and um, no time for questions on, on chat if you have time. Uh -huh, yeah, sounds good. Okay, <coughs> I, I, I'm not reading the chat. Okay, is oh, yeah, yeah. So oh, okay, uh, okay. I, I okay. If if we I have no time, then I um, I answer on the chat later. Is it okay? Yeah, so should we go on or, or, or stop the session here and take this offline? Um, we're a bit over time, so what, okay, what should we do? Okay, I see. It's all right if you eat into the break a little bit because this session is followed by a break. Oh, okay, okay. So then, Marcos, do you want to, to make to, to state your question? Um, yeah, so my question was, so it seems to be a problem of composition between the PHG and the MPC protocol. I mean, the first thing that you presented. And this composition, there's always the question of who is more to blame. Like, uh, is it more like the, that the PRG definition is not strong enough to compose with the MPC protocol, or the MPC protocol definition is, is not suitable for, for the two things to compose securely? So it, it seems, okay, to, I, to I, me, I, it seems that you kind of adapted both, both parts, but like, where do you see more, more the need to adjust things? OK, thank you. Uh, good, good. Uh, OK, so uh, first, let's... The one thing is that the semi, the, uh, the security in the semi, semi honest model is 
not sufficiently strong to, to preserve security. On the other hand, the security of the PRG is not, all, not also uh, sufficiently strong in, in order to be used inside the PRG because of, because of the visibility or in the difference of visibility or invisibility of the random seed in the security notion. Do, do I make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, Tadaki also has a question. Do you want to say it yourself, Tadaki? Okay, this is a bogus question. Oh, so, sorry. And so, but so uh, uh, for attacker, so uh, uh, it's quite good. So a uh, question: If we can succeed it in the so this initial attack for uh, ASCTR or this SP 890A, what will happen to PK? I want to know because so this is good news. If so, a PK is broken, it is this is good news for attackers. Yeah, uh, I think so. So first of all, so my my the the second part of my result is about mm. the correctness, not about the security. Mm. So the okay, and the, the correct and the, it is about the the correctness with non-zero but negligible uh, decryption error probability and. Okay. The my result means that the use of PRG may mm. uh, increase the, uh, decryption, the decryption error probability uh, in the mm -hmm. negligible way. And okay. actually, but, but actually, I actually I I haven't found any uh, example mm. in the in the practical PKE in the literature. My uh, counter example is very uh, artificial one. So I'm I'm not. Yeah, so so uh, I haven't found any counter example in the real world, I mean. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so if, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you all for, for watching this session. And, and Ki, I guess, Ki, you're gonna say what's coming next, right? Uh, yes, I shall. And um, we're going into an eight minute break right now.